All right. Welcome back to another episode of the Real Estate Investing Club. Today's a good day. It is a nice sunny day here in November, November 3rd. Got to love it. Sun out there, probably 40 degrees here in Seattle. Um, I'm going to give everybody a warning that my uh, my baby daughter is on the floor behind me, four months old. Um, we we Our childcare situation had a hiccup today, and so she might cry at points, and I'll pause the recording, but you, know, you just got to roll with it in life, in real estate. That's just how it works. Um, but I'm super excited today because we have Kenny Garza with us. Um, Kenny has a lot to go over, so I'm going to let him tell his story. Kenny, thank you very much for hopping on the show. Absolutely. Um, Gabe, honestly, a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. It's been it's been a couple months in the making, so I appreciate you. I'm excited that it's finally here, so I, I appreciate it. There you go. Uh, I told you before we got on here, we like stories. So why don't you take us to the beginning yes. of your story? How'd you get started in the real estate? Um, so I've been in real estate now for close to about seven years. Um, uh, but to back it up even a little bit further. So I grew up in, in Mexico in Monterrey. Um, I grew up there till I was 16 and we, you know, owned businesses back then. Um, so it, you know, being a business owner has always been kind of in my blood and my family. It's always been a thing. We owned a business for 40 years. So it's a, you know, big old family business in Mexico. Um, uh, started working since I was like, like legit working, like probably 10. Um, and wow. so, you know, yeah, I've been working for, for a while. <laughs> That's and, the benefit uh, of having a family business. I've always, you know, yeah, work, work is I'll, rough, especially when you're 10, but I've, I've been jealous of people who grew up in family businesses and you got that perspective. You have like entrepreneurship just boiled into your brain. So, uh, so that's awesome. Yep. And what, well, I think my, honestly, my biggest takeaway of that is work ethic. Like, I think like in, my dad was, man, he was tough. He was like, Hey, I don't care if you stayed up on Saturday till three in the morning, like Sunday morning, you got to be at the, at the, you know, the business at seven. And so it, there were some rough, rough days, but anyways, work ethic, it was a great thing, but we moved to the United States, um, to Texas when I was 16 after my dad passed, uh, unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. And so that triggered us Hard. to sell, sell everything, kind of move and kind of had to just grow up quickly. Right. Um, so I got into real estate when I was, uh, well, um, like I said, I've been, I've been looking into investing for the last seven years, but I became a loan officer, uh, in my thoughts. I was like, oh, I'm going to learn all about real estate. I'm going to become a loan officer so I can learn how to underwrite deals. Um, I didn't, <laughs> <laughs> I, le I learned how to like, you know, get people approved for a home loan, but not necessarily how to like underwrite deals and find deals. Right. And make it as an investor. So I did that very successfully. I do like the idea, though. I feel like uh, you know, getting started in real estate on the loan side, I I liked where your head was at. So uh, kudos to that. Well, the, the thing is, though, is I work for a builder here in in Dallas. So I'm based in Dallas, Texas, and um, I worked for for a new home builder, like first time home buyer. So I learned a lot about down payment assistance, you know, FHA, all the typical VA conventional loans. Um, I did a couple of like, kind of like, um portfolio non-conforming loans and that was very fun that was super exciting um but again i didn't really understood like okay how to analyze a flip how to analyze a burr how to analyze a sub to like any of those things it yeah. was just not it was foreign right? right um so anyway so i did that for three years and then february of 2021 i decided to i decided to leave so um 2020 was a great year for me um, I closed about $48 million yeah, in production. Every, uh, every loan, <laughs> loan officer back then, 2020 was. Yeah, was it was, time. it was wild. <laughs> it was wild. I did no refinance. It was all purchase. And then, uh, wow. February of 2021, um, with the support of my fiance, Camille, we, uh, decided to take the leap and go full-time real estate investing. So that's when the journey really began. And since then I've done a little bit of everything. I've, I started with doing some land flipping. Then I got into Airbnb arbitrage. Um, and then I got into a, a partnership, um, uh, with my, uh, really good friend. Uh, we, uh, did primarily wholesaling and flipping and May of this year, that partnership ended amicably. We're still really good friends, but, uh, we both decided to go our, our own route. So since May of this year, basically I rebuilt a business from the ground up and, um, you know, I, my, I guess the, the highlights of that is like in 90 days, I made over six figures. So, uh, since I, since I came, since I went on my own, so that's yeah. the, that's well, the that's, tagline. <laughs> that's a, yeah. That's a good, uh, it just goes to show that you really can 
reach your goals quicker than you think in real estate. Obviously, you had the benefit yeah. of already having that experience. And so right. you could do it a little bit faster than most people. But, um, you know, mm -hmm. I talked to so many people who want to get into real estate, they want to achieve financial freedom. And they're like, all right, in 10 years, I can get to where I need to be. I'm like, yeah. dude, it really, it really only takes one deal, to be honest, um, if you have reasonable yeah. expectations of cash flow uh, to get to where you want to be. So um, love to hear that. It's curious, you started with land flipping. Why did you choose land flipping? Um, so when, at the time when I left, I re I connected with a really good friend of mine, Mason, he's, uh, he's very successful in, in Colorado and he was doing land flipping. And so I, you know, I, I saw that he was posting, um, you know, Hey, I'm making all this money. And I was like, well, you know, that's kind of what I got to make right now. I need to make some money. Um, so I was like, Hey, how did you get started in this? And, you know, tell me a little bit about it. So I joined like the, uh, like a land flipping program. Um, so I still have access to it. I made really good relationships. So that's how it started. Um, it was honestly, it was great. I was mailing people with an offer. So like literally, hey, uh, for your lot, this Mr. Gabe Peterson. Gonna, yeah, offer you, yeah. yeah. yeah We've, uh, I've actually tried offer. that with single family. It has did not go over well, but um, but I've heard it really works well in, in land. Yeah, I, I don't know why. I wonder, it's probably because it's a, it's a, um, an asset that people are not that attached to, like it's just land, right? Like there's, it's not like they're leaving their childhood home or, uh, you know, like mom's house, dad's house that has sentimental value. So for them, it's a little more transactional, which is, which is nice. But I would literally get calls in the mail from my mail and be like, Hey, yep, I'm ready to close. And I'm talking like 25 cents on the dollar land. Um, wow. yeah. And so and, we, um, were you, uh, <laughs> this is, <laughs> yeah. I'm always interested with the land deals because, um, the strategies there. Well, first of all, the amount of money you need to close land deals is nothing compared to commercial right. deals. Um, yeah. But I hear people closing 25 cents on the dollar and I'm like, damn, did you use the uh, like the assessed value as your valuation or how'd you come up with the 25 cents on the dollar figure? All right, we're getting into it. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Um, so, man, that was actually a little bit of a grind. Um, a lot of people just take the assessed value, but what I realized after my first set of mailers was that my offers were like sometimes 5% of the value because they were what it was waterfront or it was in a very exclusive community where there's a lot of demand for. And so what I actually ended up doing is I started comping by subdivision and then I came up with an average per acre per subdivision. Mm -hmm. And so okay. I started developing this kind of, uh, criteria where, when the next the next month came and I got a new list, I had an idea of like, hey, per average in this subdivision is, I don't know, 10,000 an acre, 15,000 an acre. Then I, I over time, it got a little easier because I started developing my own data. Um, but it was a grind at the beginning, yeah. like having to comp per subdivision was was rough, um, yeah. but it, but it worked out. Um, I I did get in, you know, I, I, I don't want to say like. Um, like, oh, if you do this, it's going to happen for you. But it does happen, right? Like if you're long enough doing it, it will happen. I did get a letter signed and then returned via fax. Like I never talked to this person and they just signed the offer. I don't offer. even have a fax machine. That's a, Yeah, that's I mean, either. But I when part of the part of the of the training was like, hey, you're going to be dealing with a lot of older folks that still do fax. So make sure you have a fax number. And I was like, all right, sure. I'll just I'll do it. And I did. I got one. Uh, that it was signed over, sent via fax, never talked to the seller and we had a deal. So um, yeah, ne I never did anything bigger than probably like a $10,000 deal on land, which is, yeah. which was enough to kind of keep us going. But I was like, man, I need to do a little bit. I need to do bigger deals. Like this is and not you're, cutting you're it for me. 10,000 net. Um, no, 10,000 gross. So I would get the land for 2,500 and then I would probably wow, average. Yeah. I would probably average five to seven K per deal. Um, okay. and I would do a couple, maybe one or two per month. So again, yeah. it was enough to like supplement my income to kind of get me going. Uh, but not enough to where, like where I wanted to be. So that's how eventually we transitioned into Airbnb arbitrage, which again, that's a whole different world. Um, and then made it eventually into wholesaling and flipping, which is what we do right now. Very cool. Very cool. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting. Everybody has their own trajectory in real estate. We all get started and a lot of people get started in the wholesaling. And then, you know, we take all these different paths to get to where we end up. And uh, which is great because it's one of the reasons I love real estate. There's so many different ways exactly. to do it. Yes, um, 100%. So 
I mean, you mentioned a few things there. Why don't we fast forward to where you guys are today? Um, what's yep. your main strategy? What's your what's your bread and butter um, when you go out there today? Absolutely. So it's wholesaling. So it's wholesaling okay. in, in single family. Um, so that is that is we were flipping um, earlier this year, like May, June, July. We did a couple flips per month, um, but uh, just the way that you know the economy is and everything. We do have a couple of properties that are sitting right now. And so we're like, um, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't we shouldn't continue to like scale the flipping side and focus more on the on the wholesaling. So we're primarily we sell to to hedge funds. That's really where we're making our money at the moment. Um and I, probably we'll pro- a lot of people would probably be like, What hedge funds are still buying? Yep, they're still buying, but very low. So right, like they're they've definitely they're not buying at a hundred percent of a year one oh five or even eighty five like they used to. Um, they're buying low, but they're reliable, right? And that's really kind of what what um, we've been building our business around is reliability, and we want to make sure that if we have a deal, we can move it, right? So yep. that's really kind of what we've been focusing on at the moment. Nice, I love it. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot to jump in there. Wholesaling. I, uh, I never want to dis- discourage people from getting into wholesaling, but I don't like generally how the um, the real estate educational industry I positions totally agree. As this easy way to make money. Um, totally agree. Is, it's definitely not easy. You got to put a lot of effort into it. Um, but uh, if you if you do put the effort and you get that system working, it can it can pay off pretty well. Um, so let's talk about your business, about your wholesaling business. Um, first, let's talk about your marketing. Wholesaling always starts with getting in contact with the seller. What is the ways that you guys are reaching out? What's the volume you're doing? Um, take us through it. Yeah, for sure. But I, I wanted to back it up just a moment, Gabe. You mentioned something that I'm also super passionate about, which is um, the idea that it comes easy, right? Like, oh, you just you know you just make a couple calls and you make fifty thousand dollars. Like, oh my gosh, you know? No, that's not <laughs> that's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is not the case, nor has it ever been the case. If you see a guru teaching you that, it's just the marketing. Uh, it's just marketing. They're trying to, you know, catch your attention to sell you something. Um, in order to be able to run a truly operational wholesaling business, you need different components, right? You need acquisition, sales, training, uh, education. You need dispositions, like making relationships with people that can actually buy your deals, operations, marketing, management. I mean, there's a lot really that goes into running a wholesaling operation. Um, now, if you're doing onesie twosies and you still have your full time job, hey, that's amazing. It's additional supplemental income. But if you're like, hey, I want to jump in full time, do this full time, just be prepared because you're going to be a business owner, right? Like you're you can't you're not going to make enough money to support your family and your goals by just doing onesies or twosies. Like you're going to have to become a truly business owner. Anyways, I wanted to drop that in there because I think yeah. there's a lot of misinformation out there, and, and yeah, I'm very passionate yeah, about yeah. that as well. I 100. Um, yep. percent and um, as far as what we're doing currently for marketing, so in my previous business partnership, uh, we were doing all outbound, so cold calling, cold texting. Um, uh, that is, at the moment, it, cold texting is basically almost Gone. extinguished. Yeah, I mean, it's really, really, really hard right now with all the regulations that are coming into place to to keep that going. Um, cold calling, I still hear people having success with it, but it is a difficult um, outbound channel to manage. It's high volume, meaning high a lot of conversations to get one single contract. So um, when I started my business in May, I made a decision that I was not going to do outbound channels because I hate them. <laughs> and so, And I'm sorry if you're listening to this and you love outbound channels, kudos to you. You, I, I just don't, I, I don't have that in me. I just, and that's okay. You know, we're all built different. Um, but yeah, so I'm all inbound. So I use paper lead channels, um, primarily as our, our lead source and, uh, paper lead. Direct- so you, you gotta take us into that. When I hear paper lead, I generally think that somebody else is doing the marketing and they're sending you their leads. That's and correct. Then you pay them per that. Interesting. Okay. Yes. So yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll elaborate specifically. I mean, there's a lot of different paper lead channels out there. So I'll mention a few and, um, I'll mention the ones that I've had success with. Now, again, this is just, it varies by market. Every market is different. It depends how much you're willing to spend, how good you are with your leads. But um, you have, for instance, you have lead geeks, you have I speed to lead, you have need to sell my house fast, you have home light. Um, and those are primarily the four, the four main ones that I've kind of um, looked at. Um, I particularly use home light and need to sell my house fast. So those are my go-to primary marketing channels and then direct mail. 
Um, I use uh, a company called Investor Machine for my direct mail. And um, that's that's really what our main marketing channels are. Um, all inbound. Again, all inbound. Um, the reasoning behind that is you're going to spend more money, but your returns are higher and it's a lot better. You're not, you know, these are people that are looking for your service, which is what we're offering, right? We, you know, we're not offering a product like, hey, you know, um, I'll help you manage your finances with a $49 a month membership. Like we're offering a service and we're com convincing people that we're the best service for them, which is, you know, them, us buying their home for them. Um, so yeah, so that's really kind of what we're doing at the moment. And um, the next steps for us really is I'm, I'm trying to expand my marketing into uh, referrals. So mm -hmm. education is something that I'm very passionate about. So I'm very involved in my mastermind. Um, I've won a couple of awards for being the biggest giver. So I'm an open book about everything that I do and how I do it. And um, that, you know, it, that has actually brought in some interesting uh, returns, right? Like I, I never thought that by just being open and sharing that, you know, I could develop incredible relationships and also deals, right? Like I'm now collaborating with some great investors here in the Dallas area um, that, Hey, we split a deal. Hey, Kenny, I can't move this. Can you move this for me? Or can you close this for me? Uh, you're better at, you know, pitching sub two than I am. Can you lock it up for me? So we get to collaborate in a lot of, a lot of different ways. And, um, Man, honestly, that's been really rewarding. Just like being able to create win-win situations by by helping helping each other, right? Not, um, and man, honestly, Gabe, like I think that's something that I see a lot online, like with other real estate investors that are like, oh, you know, you got to be that, you know, the lone wolf or, you know, they show you like a lot of like chest pumping kind of thing. Um, but in reality, man, guys, don't get, don't get deceived. All of those guys are collaborating with each other. Mm. Right. They are all in the same masterminds. They all know each other and they're all collaborating. So anyways, I just say yeah. that because I think there's a difference between how real life operates and how marketing operates. And so yeah. just be aware. Well, yeah, I mean, especially um, with wholesaling, you know, we our main bread and butter is not wholesaling. We, we buy properties, reposition them. Um, but we get deals that, you know, we don't necessarily like, um, but there's still a deal for someone. And so we'll reach out exactly. to to wholesalers, to brokers, um, and just say, Hey, we got this, you got a buyer. And then we'll split, uh, split the commission on that one. And so, um, you know, being able to connect with people, uh, just, you, you already have your service, you're already doing what you're doing and, uh, just passing it along to somebody who can finish it off. I feel like is, uh, it's a great win-win situation for everybody involved. Um, yep. so yeah, love to hear that. All right. So yeah. you guys, uh, for marketing, you do inbound, you like, uh, mailers and you like, uh, what was the other one? Oh, you like buying your leads. Um, Correct. I've actually never bought leads, but I've heard people have good success with it. What yeah. is it, what do you usually buy a lead for in terms of the the per lead dollar dollar sign? So that's the cool part of, of some of these uh, paper lead marketing channels. So you get to so for example, an ISP to lead, you get to buy the lead that you want. So it's like a marketplace, and you can actually see the level of motivation. You can see the location, and you can. Basically, you can build your own avatar and decide this is the type of individual I'm going I, I'm going for, right? Because they have a certain level of motivation or they have equity or whatever. So that's pretty cool. Um, like particularly me with Need to Sell My House Fast, you don't get to really pick what you get sent. Um, but you get, you, I'm, I'm spending at the moment about $3,500 a month and I'm getting close to a 10x return on that. Um, and how many leads and, does that 3,500 generate? So I break it up in gross leads and net leads. So gross leads is basically any lead that comes into our system from our paid marketing channels. Net lead is somebody that is ready, willing, and able, meaning they want to sell, uh, they they want they can sell f uh, from a legal perspective, like there it's not in a, a state where they need to have somebody else sign off, things like that. And the the numbers make sense. They don't want you know a million dollars for their three hundred thousand dollar dilapidated home. <laughs> so, <laughs> which is a um, lot of people out there these days. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dude, it's crazy. Um, but the cool part about some of these or most of these paper lead channels is that they will refund you your money if you're not getting a legit lead. Example: oh. hmm. Let's say you spent three hundred dollars on a lead. You call them, um, and they said, uh, let's say the lead name was Gabe. Uh, Gabe Peterson and I call and it's Kenny Garza and I'm like, hey, you have the wrong number, dude. I'm like, oh, sorry. 
they will credit you those $300. Hmm, so nice. um, that is really the secret of all of this is that a lot of people give up, right? Like a lot of people after two weeks of not being able to get in touch with the lead, they give up. But what I found is like over time, it let's say it takes a month for you to finally get in touch with somebody they will still credit you that because it was never truly a valid lead. And yeah. so don't be scared to ask for those credits and, and and fight for them because, you know, it's it's money. And a lot of people just throw money at the problem and it excuse with your numbers, right? So I'm getting about 30 leads a month from their net leads or maybe 12 to 10, which typically leads to about one to two contracts per month. Um, but my assignments are fairly healthy. And again, that's just from like the need to sell my house fast, not including my other marketing channels. Cool. Um, so yeah, so th that would be kind of like my my advice there is just don't give up on your leads. Just keep working them. Yeah. <clears throat> well, yeah. And on that point, um, I've closed a deal that, you know, we had a conversation with them, you know, November 2022, and we didn't close until November 2023. It's like, I've followed up with people it. for over a year before, you know, it's different in, in commercial versus um, residential, but, uh, you know, just keep following up. It's all in the follow up. Um, and if you, if you give up on your first call, then, uh, you're, you're going to be, you're going to be hurting over the long run. So, Oh, a hundred percent. I like, well, I'm advice. curious, Gabe, what are you doing on, on the commercial side? Is it, does it differ a lot from single family? Uh, no, yeah, yeah. I started out in single family doing wholesales, um, and flips and it, the, it's the same stuff. You're, we send out mailers. We don't do, um, you know, we did texting at one point, but we've, you know, kind of put that, it's been rough, put that aside <laughs> because it's, yeah, you can't really do it anymore. Um, we yeah, still do cold yeah. calling, uh, cold calling works pretty well in commercial. Um, but really it's just, it's letters. I like letters cause you can just send them out. <laughs> it's passive. Um, yeah. You don't have to put a ton of uh, of active effort in the marketing itself, um, but once it's out there, you get calls and you get uh, you get deals. So uh, direct mail is never going to die. People always never. get letters, and it always works, um, especially if you yep. get a good. Uh, I can't remember the one that you recommended, but I use Yellow Letter Services. Uh, okay. Is that what it's called? Shit, I don't even remember. I don't want to batch that one up because I do like <laughs> yellowletterservice.com is the one I use. They're really good. Um, I use their postcards. Uh, Joe is the guy that runs it. I'm going to give him a little shout out. He's awesome. He'll He's super you know, responsive. So if you guys want to do awesome. uh, mailers, definitely Yellow Letter Service. Uh, but going back to you, sorry, I was, I was on a tangent. No, no, you're good. I was the one that asked. I'm curious. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. We... Uh, we are running down our clock, but we've only talked about marketing. I do want to talk about the other aspects of your business here. So let's, let's do it. Um, we're going to do a, a quicker one, but tell me a little bit about once you get the call, once you get the lead, tell me about the disposition side, about how the conversation goes and then how you, how you do the actual wholesale. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and summarize it just for uh, time's sake, but basically we're focusing on our four main pillars, which is uh, their timeline, their motivation, uh, the price, and then um, I'm forgetting the other one, which was, I think it's just roadblocks, uh, if I remember correctly. So basically what's stopping them from being able to make a decision? Um, are there any other additional influencers involved that we need to pull in? Um, you know, I've trained, I, I've in my previous business, um, I we had a fairly big sales operation. And so that was really what I've noticed that was one of the main things that made us not get deals is fa failing to identify influencers in a transaction. Mm -hmm. Meaning uh, I'm talking to Gabe, the seller, but Gabe's brother is an agent and I don't know of his existence. And he's the one that's influencing my seller saying, dude, yeah. don't deal with those guys. They're or they lawyers, don't... man. Lawyers, are lawyers, <laughs> aunt, uncle, grandma, you know, like there's, there's always a, some sort of real estate expert in, in somebody's circle, you know, like yeah. everybody's an agent nowadays too. So identifying those people, bringing them to the conversation tends to, to really, really help conversations. Um, but those are the four main pillars that I'm looking for in the initial call. Uh, but the goal is, and I always try to simplify it. The goal with, with the initial call is just to get, um, it just to get an appointment. Right. Like that's 100 percent the goal. Um, well, after I get my appointment and I meet with somebody, you know, belly to belly in person, the goal is to uh, push for the no. I always push for the no. Like I want them to reel me back in and ask for for our services. Right. Um, so I say, hey, buying homes for cash at market value is not something that we do. Would it still even make sense for us to talk? 
Yeah, 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 yeah. We should still talk, right? Or they say, no, 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 I want retail value. So then, okay, maybe this is a realtor referral lead. Um, so I always try to disqualify a lead more than just qualify. And I think it's a little bit of that inverse or or reverse psychology is that I'm not I'm not trying to beg for your business. I'm just trying to see if we're even a good fit. If right. we're a fit, great. If we're not, we're not. And so that's a that's a big part. You know, we set expectations, things like that. Um, I like that. Yeah. And in person, Gabe, honestly, probably you, you, I'm, I'm sure you also do this. It's just be yourself. You know, like uh, you can have a script, you can have like your pillars of what the things that you should be asking about. But people just really crave authenticity and somebody that really cares about them. And, you know, we've gotten deals deeper than in, in compet- when you're in competition with other investors. People have decided to work with us just because they liked us better you know, or they, they realize we were faith-based and I don't go advertising that I'm faith-based. I don't go telling people, Hey, we're a faith-based company. Cause it, in a, in a way it kind of almost seems like you're trading in God's name. Right. And so, but people just, people just know by the way that you act, the way that you think and the way that you speak and that you care about them. Um, and people just ask you and they know, right. So, um, I think authenticity is a very, very, very important component. Yeah, for sure. And people, uh, people smell bullshit from a mile away. Oh, so hundred percent, hundred percent, dude. Good, nah. good advice to be working under. Um, all right, I'm gonna move us on. We have run down the clock, so it's time to jump into the quick question round. Are you ready? Let's do it. Let's do it. Starts with books or any form of education. Could be a movie, a podcast, whatever. Uh, give me two recommendations: one for general life wisdom, and then one for real estate. So for real estate. I'm sorry to say this, guys. I'm going to go with the default with Rich That Poor Dad. That's what kind of got us into the the initial, uh, you know, wanting to get into investing, building doors. So it was an incredible read. And I, yeah, that was, it's yeah, a pillar, it's a right? It's, yeah, it's a classic. <laughs> um, for non-real estate, man, my favorite book is Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. Hmm. Um, it's such an incredible read. I've, and Yeah, God. people have recommended that to me. I, I do want, I love reading um autobiographies biographies oh uh, you're gonna love I shoot feel like i feel shoe like dog I'm sorry um I'm, I'm getting it on amazon right now as we speak. you should <laughs> oh my goodness man it's such a good read i mean his the nike story of what they went through um is just unbelievable you know my biggest takeaway from that one is just that adidas was already a prominent you know figure in the sports industry when it came to athletic you know wear and, and shoes at the time and so it makes me think about where you're at right now in the moment in in business right like there's always that person that's chapter 15 and you're chapter one and you think it's impossible to you know like david goliath kind of situation uh you think it's impossible to beat them but you read stories like nike's and you can't even fathom thinking like what Nike was a startup at some point, like how, what, what, uh, you know, in their story. I mean, they almost went bankrupt like seven different times. I mean, it's just absolutely phenomenal read. And Phil Knight is just such a gifted storyteller. And so it's a very compelling read on top of like just very educational. So that's, it's just amazing. Well, you sold me. I'm, uh, I'm picking it up. Uh, <laughs> nice. Moving us on to the next question. You're gonna, you have to let me know how, how you like it. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, next question, and this is for your younger self. So let's go back to the Kenny um, who's just coming over from Mexico. Go to him, look him in the eye, give him mm. one piece of advice moving forward. Um, man, honestly, I would say that uh, that you're going to be scared either way, so you might as well do it. Um, you know, if you take the chance, you're going to be scared that you're missing out on the chance. Sorry, if you take the chance, you're going to be scared that you're taking the chance. If you don't take the chance, then you have FOMO, you know, uh, and so either the fear is present either way. So you might as well do it and take a shot because it's it's so it's so worth it. You know, I make more and I've worked less. I mean, than I used to as a loan officer. I work really hard. Don't get me wrong. But um, the lifestyle that, you know, we've been able to travel, be more present in holidays with families, which is something that I, I couldn't do before with my previous job. I did miss holidays and birthday parties and um it's just been very rewarding from not only the financial perspective, which for me is secondary at this point, but it's just um, the lifestyle that's been giving us and uh, it's just been amazing and it's so worth it. There you go. Yeah. Look fear in the face and uh, take action anyways. That is a good piece of advice. Uh, moves us to the next question. This is about the US. It's a big place. A lot of opportunity out there. Give me the single metro you're most excited about investing in today. Mm, so for our for our purposes, for our goals, we're really looking into Ohio. 
Um, so either Columbus or Cincinnati, uh, from a cash flow perspective. So, um, I love really, I love Dallas for, for flips, uh, wholesales. It's a very healthy market, very, very highly competitive, but you know, the spreads are bigger. However, we're at a point where we want to build a uh, long-term wealth and start really building our, our portfolio. And we're looking into cash flow markets like Ohio. Cool. Yeah. Ohio's great. Um, all right. Next question is. We already talked about this a little bit, but you didn't say your favorite one. So I'm going to ask it anyways. Okay, it all starts with ahead. finding the lead, with getting in contact with the seller. So what is your favorite way to generate leads? Paper lead inbound. Um, 100%. And even at that point, I will say play and then pay marketing channel. So what I mean is some companies are willing to do some sort of partnership with you where you pay after the deal closes. That 100% is my favorite. Um, it keeps you sharp. You know, the quality of the leads is not as great, but it keeps you sharp. It keeps you uh, working leads. And so by the time that you do get a really good lead, you've been practicing a lot and you're ready. So that's, those are my favorite because you're still close up and you don't have to pay for it up front. Nice. Yeah. I love it. All right. Next question is about a uh, deal gone bad. Um, not every deal goes the way that we expect it to. And in those deals, that's where we learn our lessons. So what is a deal that uh, kind of uh, went, went away that you did not expect? Um, well, early this year, it was actually our first flip after we, after, you know, I, I went on my own, we bought a flip from a wholesaler and we spent like over 20, $30,000 over budget on our rehab. Um, cause you know, again, primarily we wholesale and I was like, Oh, I'm going to get into flipping. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, that, yeah, that went really bad. We did lose, we lost, you know, maybe four grand once it was all said and done, but, uh, the stress level was high. And because we, I mean, you know, we had a budget of like 40,000, you spent 30. Well, where do you think the other 30 come from? It's all cash from your pocket. Yeah. And so, um, you know, that, that, yeah, that was a, that was a rough one. And so what was the, uh, what was the lesson you learned from that? Um, that flipping is not as, uh, sexy nor easy as it may seem. <laughs> uh, like it's a completely different, uh, branch of your business. Construction project management is a completely different side of your business and only do it if you have the time and you're ready to take on something like that. Um, cause it's going to pull you away from other potential dollar producing activities. Yeah. Well, and that's why people specialize in things like just wholesaling because, or just flipping, yes. because once you, you know, you really do have to be an expert in that arm of real estate to yes. get the returns that, um, that, you know, you see these guys on the internet showing, uh, yep. you know, if you focus hundred percent on flipping and you get good at flipping, it's a great business to be in. Um, but again, you have to focus in it. You have to build the systems. You have to be disciplined just like wholesaling, just like uh, repositioning commercial. Um, you just got to pick one lane and just stick to that lane until you get really good at it. So I, uh, I did the same thing totally agree. I, yeah, <clears throat> I got, I did the same thing when I started, I, you know, did everything I wholesaled, I did flips, um, and I wasn't good at any of them. And so it wasn't until <laughs> I, so I, what did you decide I to do? Chose one path. So I, now, I mean, we only do um, commercial. We do self storage, mobile home parks, and uh, um, mobile home RV, and we do repositioning. So we, you know, look for properties that need a little bit of love, give them that love, and then uh, and then hold them or or sell them off. So, but go. the key was we we found one thing we wanted to do, and we got good at it. Um, we just kept at that one thing until we understood how to do that, versus yes. just skipping along and into different areas. So. Um, I love that. I think that's a great lesson. And it's a lesson that a lot of people, they have to learn the hard way. Unfortunately, yep. I also had to learn the hard way. So I don't know I why we there. do that. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody's listening to this and they're going to be like, oh, you know, I'm going to be the exception to the rule. And it's like, all right, well, <laughs> we'll talk in a few months. Yep. <laughs> yeah. All right. Next, uh, next question is for the listeners. You've given us a lot to think about. I'm sure people want to reach out, get in contact with you. What is the best yep. way for them to do that? Um, it's just going to be through social media. So uh, primarily Instagram. Uh, so Kenny J Garza, it's my tag. You can also find me on Facebook and um, X or Twitter. Um, I'm I'm actively working on uh, putting out a lot of content, uh, just add, adding value to people without necessarily selling anything. Um, just, you know, showing people our journey and what it actually is or looks like uh, without the fluff, right? Without just the highlight reel of, you know, showing your paychecks, but rather what goes behind the doors. So um, I'm trying to humanize what we do a little bit more and just show people what it's actually like. Nice, man. I love it. And that is, uh, 
Kenny with two N's, J Garza, G A R Z A. So if you guys want to reach out to Kenny, um, you know, find him on all all the different social platforms, and I will put his uh, Instagram URL in the show notes. So just click that little more in the description. It'll pull down the full description, and there you can find his URL. Uh, all right, Kenny, that wraps it up. Awesome. Thank you very much for hopping on the show. Thanks, Gabe. Thanks for having me. Congratulations on your baby, by the way. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's surprising that she didn't. Uh, she's just hanging out there on the floor, you know, having fun. So it's a it's a good day for everybody here. That's awesome. Yeah, uh, we're trying to have our like late night low FM DJ voice here, right? Like just kind of keep her soon. <laughs> <There you laughs> <go>. All <laughs> right. For everybody who's here with us today, thank you guys for showing up. You are the reason we do this. So if you guys have any questions whatsoever, reach out to me, Gabe, at the real estate investing club dot com. Um, if you guys want to support the show again, all we ask, like, subscribe, share all that jazz. Other than that, I hope you guys have a great week. Keep rocking real estate, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode.